Yep. And we are live. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Legal Lunch and Learn, a weekly live show where we ask an expert your questions on a legal topic. My name is Cindy. I am a staff attorney here at Maryland Legal Aid. The co-host of the show is our director of Community Lawyer Initiative, Megan McDermott. Hey, Cindy. Our production engineer is Alec Chase. You don't see her here, but be assured that she is working tirelessly in the background to make sure everything's running smoothly. Joining us today is our expert on protective orders, Sierra Abay. Hi, Cindy. So for those of you who have questions about protective orders, how they work, how they can protect you, please put them in the comment section down below. Of course, if you do want to maintain your privacy, you can also direct or private message us. And as per usual, if you do have an immediate legal issue, be a protective order or something else, please contact us and we'll put our contact information in the comment section down below as well. For those who do need to hear it, our email here is lawyer at mdlab.org. That's L-A-W-Y-E-R at M-D-L-A-B dot O-R-G. Our phone number here is 443-451-2805. And for those who do need captions, our videos are uploaded to YouTube after the recording is done. So make sure you're checking back to our Facebook page for links to those. And last but not least, just because you do take some advice from our um, weekly lectures, there is no attorney or client, attorney and client, there we go, relationship between you, any of the attorneys that you see here today or with Maryland Legal Aid. So again, if you do have questions about a legal issue and you do want to speak with an attorney one-on-one, -on -one, please make sure that you're contacting us. So with all of that out of the way, um, hi, Sierra, how are you doing today? I'm good, it's been another busy morning here, but it's been a good day. Yep, I'm glad to hear that you got out of court, all right, to come talk to us. Um, so unlike uh, some of the other people that we do have on the show, I actually don't know you very well. Talk to us about your experiences, uh, either here at Legal Aid or before. So I started working here at Maryland Legal Aid, um, I guess, a little bit over a year and a half ago, maybe. Um, and ever since then, I've been doing protective orders, family law, divorce, custody cases in the statewide advocacy um, unit of Maryland Legal Aid. Um, so in terms of your unit and the kind of cases that you take, um, can you just tell our audiences um, what type of cases that Legal Aid takes? Yeah. In terms so of our, protective orders. Yeah, so our unit's a little bit of a carve out here at Maryland Legal Aid. So we do a lot of um, cases involving uh, domestic violence and sexual assault. That is our unit's, I guess, nature specialty here. Um, so to be, so if a protective order does come in, um, our unit tends to get that referral. So we have a good amount. We have four attorneys in our unit um, that work tireless, tire, tirelessly um, in Baltimore County, Baltimore City, Howard County, and um, Carroll County is the four counties we operate in Maryland. Um, and we'll take cases from peace orders, protective orders, and then divorce and custody cases as well. Yep, so what if someone has um, a protective order issue in a county that's not in that's not one that you named? Can they still so contact you? Yeah, so they can still contact us. We'll do our best to provide some limited advice and counsel, but a lot of times we'll try to also refer them um, maybe in-house to another um, Maryland Legal Aid um, county office to see if they can help or, and we always turn, like if we're unable to represent, we always provide them with information and other organizations that can help connect them in those counties. Yep, absolutely. And of course, coming to the lawyer initiative here, which is a unit that, uh, Megan and I are in, um, are statewide. So make sure, you know, even if you're in one of the counties that it was not named by Sierra, make sure you're contacting us for legal support. So, um, after all of that, I feel like I've known you and I know you a lot better now, <laughs> or mostly what you do. Um, yeah. So let's go to the bread and butter of what you do. So just to begin with, uh, what exactly is a protective order? So a protective order is a court order that is basically saying to one person, you need to stay away from another individual and refrain from doing certain acts. Um, it's Maryland's version of a restraining order. Um, or a civil stay away order. Um, so just kind of think of it as a, a civil order to establish or that's established to protect um, victims of domestic violence. 
how is that different? So I hear the term peace order a lot too. So how is this different? So a peace order is just a little bit different than a protective order. A peace order is a, another available form of protection for someone who's experiencing issues with an individual, um, including someone that they're dating who you're not sexually involved with, um, a neighbor, a stranger, or someone else. So an only time an individual can get a peace order is if they're not eligible for a protective order. Um, so let's go into eligibility. Um, who can, who is eligible for a protective order? So under the statute, um, there is certain relationships that will qualify you for a um, protective order. And those qualification, qualifying relationships are if you're married to the individual, if you're divorced to the individual, and it, again, this includes if you're still married, but you're currently separated. Um, if you're related by marriage, blood, or adoption. And again, this includes um, a step parent or a step child if they have lived with you for at least 90 days in the past year. Um, another instance is if it's a cohabitant, um, which is defined as um, living together um, for at least 90 days within the past year and having a sexual relationship. Um, having a child in common qualifies you. Um, having a relationship, a sexual relationship with that person within the past year also qualifies you. Um, and then if you're a vulnerable adult. And a vulnerable adult is considered an individual who lacks the physical or mental capacity to provide their own daily life's needs. Um, and then additionally, there's another new addition for the protective order statute, um, which is if you are raped or sexually assaulted by another person, um, and this includes attempts um, within the last six months. So it's not the year duration anymore for the rape carve out, it is six months. Okay, so uh, if, you're, if you're in a situation where you're living in the same household, but you don't have that kind of relationship with the person who is abusing you, would you have to uh, file a peace order instead? No, so you can also still file a protective order. Um, you have to be living with that person for the duration of 90 days within the past year. Um, oh, I'm sorry, yes. So as a cohabitant, you would have to be living with that person and have that sexual relationship, yes. Okay, so um, let's go to the kind of things that might trigger your eligibility mm -hmm. to file a protective order. So, and, and I know this goes into a dark, dark uh, subject, but can you give examples of what counts as abuse um, you know, either under the yeah. statute or, you know, yep. Okay, so um, yeah, so there, there are many things that count as abuse under the statute. Um, acts under the statute are, and any act that causes seriously serious bodily harm, you can think of these as if someone punches you, if someone kicks you, if someone stabs you, shoots at you or shoots you, um, they choke you, um, they throw an object at you, that object hits you or nearly misses you. Um, if someone, or someone simply bites you, um, another incident, as I described just recently, is someone throws something at you but nearly misses you. Um, so if something, someone doesn't act like that, that causes you like fear of serious imminent bodily harm. So the fear that you are going to be seriously injured can also qualify you for abuse under the statute. Um, another thing to consider is an assault. And that's an assault in any degree. So it can be someone punching you as hard as they can in the face or someone hitting you in the arm or something similar like that. So it doesn't have to be a large incident. It just has to be an incident that causes an assault. Um, and then so, rape or, oh, go ahead. No, 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 go on. Um, so then there's also rape and sexual offenses. Um, and that again, includes the attempts of rape and uh, an attempted sexual offense. Um, false imprisonment, which means if someone keeps you in a room where you're locked in and you cannot leave, that qualifies for a protective order. Um, with that, you've got to really consider, of, is there any other exit? out of that room. You're really confined in a certain space. Um, stalking and then also revenge porn. Right, and of course, you know, if you're not sure, I'm sorry, I'm talking to the audience here. So mm -hmm. dear audience, if you're not sure um, if what happened to you counts as abuse or is able to trigger your eligibility, give us a call and uh, we'll try to walk you through it. So with all those things listed, um, you know, me having a background in doing criminal defense, it sounds awful a lot like, you know, a criminal issue. So how is the protective order different or how is it perhaps extra helpful to have in addition to maybe a criminal charge? So it, 
It is similar. Um, a lot of the times you do find that protective orders and there are criminal charges involving the same certain facts of the cases. Um, so with the criminal charges, the state carries the criminal case. Um, it is the state suing the individual um, or charging the individual. And in a protective order case, it is the petitioner. It is the person that is filing, which means the person that is filing also carries the burden of proof in a protective order case. Um, the burden of proof in a protective order case is preponderance of the evidence, which means that a judge will find it is more likely than not that it happened. Um, and the easiest way to think about that is if it's 51%. So is it more likely that a, the scales kind of tip in your favor, it's going to be granted? Um, again, you have that burden of proof that to prove to the judge that um, an abuse happened or any of the other acts under the statute happened. Um, and then conversely, in a criminal case, it's the standard of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt. So it's a lower standard for this for this civil protective order than what the state carries with a criminal case. Yep, yeah, absolutely. So now we are starting to get into the nitty gritty of getting one mm -hmm. filed and how, how the case is going to work. So let's let's begin there. Um, if I want to file one, where do I go? So if you want to file one and the courts are open, so it's a weekday and the courts are open between 8.30 and 4.30, um, you can go to a courthouse. You can either file at the district court or the circuit court um, in the county where the abuse happened. That's important. It needs to have, you need to file in the place where it happened. Um, if the courts are closed, a petitioner, so the person filing can file a petition with the commissioner's office. Um, the commissioner's offices are open 24-7 um, and there, there are many locations around the state um, and to find locations that are nearest to you, you can go to the MarylandCourts.gov website. They also provide the phone numbers of the commissioner's office, the locations, and if their hours do different, differentiate from 24 seven, that information is there. Um, I would do a quick caveat because of this current pandemic. If you're planning on going, maybe give them a phone call and see if they have any extra security or safety measures that are currently in place for filing a petition if they have a certain times open or if they're only allowing certain people in or what's going on because with the current pandemic, we don't know if they do have any safety measures that they are taking in place, but they are open 24 seven. Yep, absolutely. And um, is there anything that you had to bring with you when you go to file either at the commissioner's office or in court? Um, like, you know, do you have to bring money? Uh, do you have to bring any documents? So for protective order, there is no filing fee. Um, in the state of Maryland, it is free to file a petition for a protective order. That is different than a peace order. There is a filing fee for a peace order. I do want to make that clear. So if you are filing a peace order, not a protective order, you will need some funds on you. Um, for a protective order, there is no filing fee. It's waived um, by the court because it's a domestic violence situation. Um, you will want to bring evidence with you. You are going to want to bring anything that makes your case for you. So if you've got medical records, if you've got pictures, if you've got uh, a police report, anything like that that helps support your case, you should take it with you. Um, it is important to note that the commissioner or the judge originally hearing your case is going to want to talk to you and they're going to want to listen um, to what you have to say, but also what you have to see. Because anything that helps your case, you should take with you. If you don't, if you don't have anything though, if you don't have any pictures or it, not even a witness, um, can you still file? So yes, you can still file without a witness or without any pictures, without any documentation, tangible evidence. Um, so the grounds for your first protective order, if, if you file with a commissioner, it's an interim order. Um, if you file with the courts, it's going to be a temporary order because you're in front of the judge already. Um, the Grounds and the burden of proof for those cases are reasonable grounds. So it's, can a judge reasonably believe that this abuse happened to you? So if you don't have um, all of the tangible evidence with you at the moment, or if you don't think you have anything important that you should take with you, you should still go and seek that protection because ultimately this is about your protection. Um, and then if you do need advice or want to figure out if you will, if you think you can meet those higher, that preponderance of the evidence standard at that final hearing, you should reach out to an attorney because an attorney can help advise you on what evidence you might not even think you have. Yeah, and I think it's also just nice to have someone in your corner where you're, mm -hmm. you know, making a statement very officially in a courtroom. Um, yeah. 
so, so with, the boards are technically a little bit more open, so you don't you don't have to technically go alone as much anymore. So if you want to bring a friend or an advocate, there are some great state programs that have advocates that will support you in these steps. So those are great uh, resources to look into. So Cindy's right; it's it is hard to go alone for these instances. Uh, so when you do go to get your interim order or temporary order, um, what happens? What kind of questions do the ju judges or whoever's hearing the case ask? Yeah, so if a judge or a commissioner is hearing your case, um, it's going to be pretty simple off the bat. They're going to ask what happened, when it happened, what is your relationship with the person you're filing against, which is why it's important to remember who is eligible. Um, I think one of the most common things is also, it's a very uncomfortable question that judges have to ask or commissioners have to ask is, when was the last time you had a sexual encounter? Um, it, they're not trying to pry into your private life. They're trying to really figure out if you're eligible for this. And it, they are, I trust you, they are just as uncomfortable asking you that question as you are answering that question. Um, other questions that they'd ask is, has there ever been any past incidents, incidences of abuse? Um, are you in fear that this is going to happen again? Um, what other types of relief that are you asking for? Um, they're going to want to figure out what's going on um, and to find out if you are eligible for this relief. Yep, absolutely. And I think it's also nice to have attorney at this stage to just, you know, go over the questions with you ahead of time so you know what to expect. Um, and in case the viewers don't know already, we strongly advocate to uh, for people to speak with an attorney before they handle any sort of legal issue if they can. And especially because we do offer free legal service, um, feel free to contact us if you do want to talk to one of one of us. Um, so now that you have a interim or temporary protective order, what happens next? Do you have to go back to court again? Yes. Yeah, so if you have an interim order, an interim order only lasts for two business days after the courts are open. So you've, sp you've spoken to a commissioner, then your next step would be a temporary protective order. Um, so you, your next step again would be meeting that reasonable ground standard, but this time you would be in a courtroom with a judge. Um, so, and then if you were already in front of a judge for your temporary order, your next step is the final protective order. Um, again, the final protective order evidence standard is a little bit higher. It is a preponderance of the evidence, which means more likely than not did this happen. Um, I'm going to reiterate what Cindy just said. If you haven't spoken to an attorney between, before filing, um, it's a good time to reach out to an attorney before the final protective order hearing. Um, even if you think you're confident enough to go by yourself, speak to an attorney. They can provide you information on what to expect um, or to make you think of things maybe you haven't thought of yet, uh, because that's really what the attorney's job is to tell you and present you with all of the options and all of the information. Um, so if you're at your final protective order hearing, um, the judge will call your case and you will have to go up to the tables in front of the courtroom. Um, you will, if your and if the respondent is served, he should, he or she should be there. So you'll go to one table and they will go to the other table. Now I can, I can imagine that this is nerve wracking for most people because you don't wanna be standing in that proximity with that individual. Um, so again, you'll be there, you'll bring, make sure you take all of your evidence with you. If you have any individuals who can testify to anything that they saw that they witnessed um, about the abuse, you should bring them with you as well. This is your hearing. This is the moment that the court is going to grant or deny the protective order. And again, you have that burden of proof. Um, so you'll, if you are represented by an attorney, your attorney will ask you questions on direct examination. Um, and then if the respondent, the person that you're alleging abuse against is represented by counsel, their attorney will then have the opportunity to ask you follow-up questions called cross-examination. Um, and if he's not represent or she is not represented by counsel, they have that direct opportunity to ask you questions. Um, and I know that can be very traumatic to have to relive the situation, but it is the steps that typically would be that would be taken. They can choose to ask you questions or choose not to ask you questions. Um, and then conversely, they will then get their chance to testify and then you'll have the chance either through counsel or on your own to ask them follow-up questions. Um, so it does sound, uh, oh, sorry to interrupt. So it does sound like um, whether you have an attorney or not, when you do go to the final protective hearing, the judge will want to hear from both sides. 
Yes, so that is if there is a hearing that's going to happen. Um, respondents also, I think it's important for everyone to know that um, respondents also have the option of consenting to a final protective order. Um, consenting to a final protective order just means that they are not admitting to any of the allegations of abuse that the petitioner, so that you filed against them. They're just agreeing to the terms of staying away. Um, and there are many reasons why someone may consent to a protective order. One of the major reasons is if there are those criminal charges pending. Um, so that's something to consider that he might or she might just say, you know what, I'm fine with staying away from you and I'm going to do that. And there needs to not be a hearing that day. Yeah. But either way, if you're the person who filed, make sure you're showing up to the hearing, right? Yes. So if you filed and you fail to show up, they will dismiss your order. Um, they will, um, just that alone, you need to be present. If the respondent is served and there, you need to be served and you need to be there, not served, but you, you need to be there. Um, there. I know also witnessing lots of frustration in a courtroom when someone's not served. So you as the petitioner go expecting for a hearing and the judge informs you that there has been no service. So the respondent doesn't have knowledge of this hearing. That's an extremely frustrating situation to be in because you want to get this, you want this level of protection and you want it to be a final order. You don't want it to be the temporary order. Um, but un until there is service, the judge cannot put a final order into place um, because and of of the laws of due process. Right. Yeah, sorry, yeah. just just to back you up just a tiny bit. So when we talk mm -hmm. about service, uh, can you explain more? So for those who are not attorneys, can you explain a little bit more what that entails? Yes, so for protective orders, it's a little different than any of the other aspects. Um, they need to be served by the sheriff's department. So you cannot just have someone go and hand him paperwork to say you have a hearing at this time and this day, you better be there. Um, so for the protective order, the court gives a compilation of filing um, a bunch of papers that include your petition. And if there's an interim order or a temporary order, that goes into the packet that the sheriff then will deliver and hand deliver to the respondent, um, to the person you filed against. Um, that person needs to have this information so they have knowledge of what is being filed against them um, and what you're alleging against them. And it gives them the information of when the hearing date is. Um, so if they're served, they have the opportunity to come to the hearing or not to come to the hearing. It is their choice at that point. But again, if you're the petitioner, go to the hearing. Yep, absolutely. Def I mean, if you're not the petitioner, maybe also go to the hearing. <laughs> yeah, if you're not the petitioner, go to the hearing. It's your choice. It's best, definitely in your best interest to go to a hearing when you are mm -hmm. supposed to be in front of the court. Yep. So after all of that, um, what happens if your case gets dismissed and um, can you reapply? So if your case is dismissed for your failure to show up, um, you can file an, uh, or if your case is denied for you not meeting the burden of proof that you have, um, you have the option to appeal. There is an appeal period, which means you can file with, a, with the court saying you want to have the case retried. Um, the appeal period it provides you 30 days from the order put into place. So when you have your you have your final protective order hearing, um, say it's on, we'll say it's today. So it's November 10th. If the order was dismissed or denied today, you'd have until December 10th to file a notice with the court that you want the case reheard. Um, so if you filed in district court, which is the lower court, um, you you can your case will be appealed to circuit court. And that new hearing is a brand new trial. It is a it is completely new. None of the, none of the evidence can be taken into consideration from the lower courts hearing. So you need to bring everything back again with you, and you can bring new evidence that you think is going to be more helpful. Um, so let's say you do have a final order entered. Um, what kind of relief can you ask the judge to provide? So relief. There's, there's plenty of things that the judge can order for you. Um, the main few when you think of a protective order are to have the abuser to stop abusing you, stop contacting you, stop harassing you, stop threatening you. Um, the court can order for them to stay away from you. This includes that they can order for them to stay away from your home, work, school. If the abuser does not know these locations, you do not have to disclose these locations. 
you can tell the court that for safety reasons, he does not know where I live and I wanna keep it that way. Um, because at the end of the day, this a protective order is about safety. Um, yeah. So yeah, so if he doesn't know where you work, you can say, I work at, I want my undisclosed location of employment protected, which means if he stumbles on that location, he now knows it's there and he cannot go there. So just because it's not written as the name of the employer or the name of the school, doesn't mean that you're not protected there. This order carries with you wherever you go. Um, other places, other things that it can order is if you, if you guys do share a home, um, it can order use and possession of your home. There are some requirements that we get, Cindy and I can talk about in a little bit um, for the use and possession of a home. Um, they can order temporary custody of children if you've got children in common. Um, and with custody comes visitation. If visitation is permitted, if it's not um, dangerous for the children to be with that respondent. Um, the fun one is always possession of a pet. Well, maybe it's not fun, but you, you do want to decide where your pet is going to be. So they can order temporary possession of a pet. They can order financial support known as emergency family maintenance um, in a protective order case. They can order, um, if again, if you have kids to stay away from the child care provider. Um, another big one is um, the surrender of firearms. So if they have access to a gun, the court will remove that from their possession. Yep. So let's let's do circle back to the possession and mm -hmm. use of the house. So uh, sure. I'm imagining a circumstance where the abuser or the respondent um, actually owns a house. Okay. Um, what happens then? Can you still ask the judge to have them not use it anymore? Um, so a practical answer is it's going to be a lot harder for you um, if they own the home, if they've made all the payments to the home, like if it's their home, it's going to be a little bit harder. Um, it's not saying a no. Of course, in the law, you always hear people say it depends. Um, so there are some instances where the court can order use and possession of the home. Um, think if you and the respondent are married, you're living together. Um, and at the time of the abuse, um, you're still living in the same home, the court can order the abuser to leave the home. This is if you both are titled on the house. Um, it can also be ordered if it's just them on the house. Um, again, it might be a little bit harder to get that, but it's not a solid no answer. Um, another instance is if, if you're not married, but you're living together at the time of abuse and your name is on that deed or lease, this is where it matters if they own the home or not. Um, the court can order them to leave the house. If, again, your name, is on that deed or lease and you were living together at that time. Um, there's another great carve out. So if you're not married and you and the abuser are living together for at least 90 days within the past year, the court can order the abuser to leave. So that's a 90 day within the past year, Mark. So that's why it's not a solid no, but it's a little bit harder to get them if they are the ones titled on the house. So it's really just a bunch of considerations. And this would be a great time for you to consult an attorney to ask, do I have really a leg to stand on with this instance? Yep, absolutely. So um, we are starting to run short, short on time, but this is a really important question. Um, what can I do? Uh, so after a final uh, protective order center, what can I do if the respondent violates the order? So if the respondent violates the order, my first instinct is if, they, if their violation is if they're contacting you and harassing you, call the police. Um, the protective order does carry its own misdemeanor criminal charge that can result in jail time and a fine. Um, so if they are continuing to harass you and contact you, you should be calling the police. Um, if it is them not paying the emergency family maintenance, that's a civil contempt. Um, and that should, there should be something filed with the court at that point. Um, but again, if they are harassing you, if they are still bothering you, if they are contacting you when the order specifically says stay away, that is a criminal violation of a protective order and call the police. Yep, absolutely. And on that grim aspect of protective <laughs> orders, now let's, let's turn to Megan for some questions from the audience. Hey, Sierra. Hey, Megan. Um, so just a couple questions. Can someone file a protective order for someone else? So they're concerned about their kid or maybe um, a grandparent or something like that. 
So there are certain instances where someone can file on behalf of someone else. Typically, if you are over the age of 18, however, you need to file your own. Um, if certain relationships exist, you can file on behalf of someone else. If you're filing on behalf of a minor child, um, you can file a protective order on behalf of a minor child. Um, that, and that abuse also incur, includes the abuse that was elicited in the beginning. Um, and if um, you are an adult living in the home uh, with the minor child or, your, or a relative. So those are the two caveats that you need to be for a minor child. It is if you live with the if you're living in the home with a minor child and you're witnessing this abuse, or if you are a relative of the minor child, you can file on behalf of a minor child. Um, if it's a grandparent, you've got to think: Are they a vulnerable adult? Which means, can are they functioning on their own daily lives with the mental and physical capacities, or are they not? So, if they're classified as a vulnerable adult, you can file on their behalf. But if they are not a vulnerable adult and they are over the age of 18, they will need to file on their own. Okay. And what about people who might have concerns about folks outside of their family, but you know, you're really close to your next door neighbor or something and they're an adult and you're concerned about um, abuse or something you've observed. Is there any, can you file a protective order in that case or do you really not have any standing to do that? So in that instance, you really don't have any standing to do that. Um, if it's just the next door neighbor and you're witnessing stuff and there's always great considerations and supports and stuff and maybe reach out to them, but under the protective order st statute, you cannot file on their behalf. Again, unless they're over the age of 18 and they're not classified as a vulnerable adult, they'll need to file on their own. Okay. Um, and sticking with kind of the minor child um, aspect of things. So is there, um, instances where custody is attached to protective orders. There might be a ruling about um, custody of the child. Yeah, so that's, that's pretty common. Custody is typically spoken about in protective order cases. If you already have a civil case, I mean, a, a custody case in circuit court, a lower court won't discuss it. But if there's no current custody order, so you're going to court for the first time and you're asking for custody of your children, it it is likely that the court will address who the kids will be staying with. It also means that they'll probably come up with some sort of visitation schedule. Um, but again, the protective order only can extend for a year for a final protective order. So that means that this is a temporary custody arrangement. It does not contain anything past that the duration of the order. So it's, it's really just temporary. So okay. that doesn't mean you shouldn't still worry or consider doing something that's more permanent in the aspects of custody. Okay, so um, if the protective order is a year and there's custody arrangements attached to the protective order, can you during that year file um, for regular custody for lack of a better term? Yeah, so during that year at either party, you or the respondent can file for custody in the higher court, which is the circuit court. In Maryland, you need to file that in circuit court um, and you can get that ball rolling to get a permanent custody agreement set dur during the time you have that protective order. And that protective order is gonna control until you have an order in that other case. And if that case is, an order is given, um, changing the custody arrangement that the circuit court ruling will control. It will override that district court protective order custody arrangement. And I think that's important to know as well. Okay, yeah, definitely. Um, Cause that can get confusing. Um, so I know this is a really real concern for people um, and they want to file a protective order, but they've you know, been a victim or a survivor of abuse and they have concerns about their partner or other abuser retaliating once the person they're served with you know, the, the protective order hearing. So what do you tell people um, who have that kind of concern and are, do you point into specific resources or what do you recommend? Of course. Um, so this is a very real concern. Um, I know I see it on my daily life um, with my job. Um, it's called safety planning. Um, so have a plan. So you know this person, you know this abuser most likely better than most people. Um, you have a real, you might have a relationship with them um, or you've known them for a while and something happens. So you know, how, you have a good idea of how they're going to react. So you should make a plan. So if you file this protective order, do you know 
you know when you filed, so you know when they're going to start effectuating service or looking to get someone served. Um, do you want to be in the house at that time? Do you want your children to be around them at the time? Do you have a place where you can go where you feel safe? Um, these are all very valid concerns and questions that people face in these kind of situations. Um, and there are some great resources. There's some advocates across the state that are specific to helping victims of domestic violence. Um, so I think that's a great, they're great resources. If you don't know any of these places or indications, I know um, Maryland Legal Aid can help connect you with those um, resources um, mm -hmm. to help start getting that safety planning going for you. But again, at the end of the day, you need to know if it's, if you're, are you safer filing for a protective order? Are you safer leaving the situation? What is your, what is the safest route for you? because you do know this person the best and you know how they're gonna react or likely how they're gonna react. So do you have a safe place to go right. after this happens? So it sounds like sometimes a protective order might not be the right fit for somebody just depending on what, what their personal situation is. Right, so it, it, a filing for protective order is, it's a personal decision. Um, you can speak to an attorney, you can speak to advocates, you can speak to anyone else about what your options are. Um, but at the end of the day, it's it's up to you to find out if it's going to provide you the safety that you need. I'm not trying to deter anyone from filing. I think they're a great civil resource and get great at adding an extra level of protection. But at the end of the day, it is a personal decision on if you think you're better off having one or not. Okay. And a question about um, sort of the timing for, for filing and any instances of abuse. So. Um, I know sometimes in addition to a protective order, there might be a criminal charge associated with um, abuse, like a second degree assault charge or something like that. And um, the, the person is incarcerated because of that criminal charge. So the person who was abused might not file a protective order at that time because they know the person is going to be incarcerated for a couple of years. Um, then say the person who was incarcerated is released what avenues does the person have that they are, their concerns might be very valid, um, the, the person's being released from incarceration and might blame them for, for the incarceration. Can they file a protective order then, even though the abuse happened potentially, you know, five years prior? Um, or what's, what's, what are some avenues for them? So one great consideration with that is did an event happen that make, places you in fear of imminent bodily harm? So if he's in, incarcerated for five years, four years, and you didn't file at that point, but now he's released, does that release place you in fear of imminent bodily harm? Because if that's the case, that is your filing event, or it can be your filing event. So just because you didn't file right away, did something else happen? Think about what else happened, or what else is a consideration now why you feel like you need one and th that's a great question and one of the best answers I can give you for that is you should reach out to an attorney they're going to be able to let you know like hey yes that that's an event that would qualify you or I mean yeah you can try there it's really up to you but when someone is incarcerated there's criminal charges and if they were incarcerated as a result of the abuse um it it may give you grounds and again, it's on an instant by instant basis and it's best to speak to an attorney. Okay. Um, and kind of related because I know, you know, protective orders, people still are, are afraid even if there's a protective order in place. Um, are there ever instances where protective orders are permanent or last for longer than a year? So protective orders can be extended. Um, I'll start with the permanent ones. So protective orders can be permanent. Um, and they're available to anyone who's gotten an interim protective order, a temporary protective order, or a final protective order, where the abuser has convict, been convicted of any crime and has been sentenced to five, serve at least to five years and have served at least 12 months. This is a recent change in the statute where it used to have to be the crime related to the protective order. Um, as of last, as of October 1st, it's now any crime. Um, and then again, protective orders can be extended to a can be extended to another year if an event occurs that allows you to file for an extension of the protective order. Okay. So there has to be events that happen to allow for the extension or to get you a permanent protective order. There has to have been a crime and there has to have been a five-year sentence, at least a five-year sentence with 12 years served. 
Okay. It'll be 12 months served. Sorry, not 12 years. That would not mathematically make sense. This is why. <laughs> No worries. Um, okay, oh, great. But with, oh. Sorry, but with the with the temp with the permanent protective order, the the terms don't all the terms won't extend. It's it's limited to they shall not abuse, they shall not harass, and they shall not contact you. So if there's other additional terms, those most likely will not carry with the permanent protective order, like custody or something like that. Right. Okay, that's good to know. Um, I think I have one final question before we wrap up and bring Cindy back on. Um, what about sort of um, interstate orders? So someone has an order from Pennsylvania and they are moving to Maryland. Um, can it be enforced in Maryland? And same deal, like if you're moving out of Maryland, you have an order from here, there's still six months left on your order, what happens? That's a great question because people move all the time. Um, so under Maryland law, Maryland will enforce a protective order that's issued in another court of another state. Um, but there is the one caveat with Maryland that Maryland will only enforce that out of state protective order um, to the extent that the relief is granted under Maryland law. So if the out of state order grants something that Maryland law would not grant in a protective order, that part may fall through the cracks. Um, but as a whole, a protective order does carry from one state to another. Um, for it to be enforced in Maryland, it does not have to be registered in Maryland court. Um, but that is a choice and it's an option that someone can take. If you feel more comfortable when you move to go to the courthouse and file it to have it on record in Maryland, you can do so. Um, so now if you're in Maryland and you're moving out of state, um, under the Violence Against Women's Act and the full faith and credit clause of the United States Constitution, your Maryland protective order will be enforced in other states, just like Maryland enforces it. Um, however, again, how Maryland has that one caveat, other states may have that as well. So it is recommended that you should look into the laws of your destination state. Talk to an attorney in that destination state to see if there's any additional requirements or limitations of that order. It's always important to know when you're moving what carries with you and what does not. Okay, so if you choose not to register your order in the state that you moved to, um, but something happens and you need to call the police and you show them a copy of the order from the other state, the police will still enforce that, it sounds like. They should, yes. Okay, yeah. Okay, um, those are all my questions here. Thank you, it's really um, tough but important information. So we'll bring Cindy back on to, to wrap things up. Okay, thanks, Megan. Thank you, Megan. Um, all right, Sierra. So now we're at the end. Uh, what would you say is the most important thing you would like our audiences to know about protective orders? So I was actually reminded of this this morning while I was in court um, by the judge who was sitting on the bench um, that the two parties or the two people that are in this courtroom for a protective order, um, it's not a good place for either of them. Um, no one's gonna leave that courthouse happy, regardless of what's going on. One person has gone through abuse. The other person is being found that they have committed this abuse they've, or they've consented to an order if there are kids involved. There's a new custody arrangement set up. Um, so no one's leaving this as a winner. And I think that's a very important thing to remember that with protective orders, it's very sensitive subjects and it is very hard to recount and re-talk about everything that's gone on. Um, so I think it's important to remember that feelings are really involved with these. And if you need a moment to not uh, like whether you're testifying or just talking to an attorney, take the moment, take a breath and then continue because emotions are very high in these. And I think that's important for everyone at any either side, respondent, petitioner, that you are in front of a, a court of law and it's hard to be in front of a court of law talking about feelings or events that happened. Um, so just to remember that they're to be respectful because it is hard. And again, as the judge stated today, no one really leaves a courthouse after a protective order hearing or even filing a protective order happy. Yep, absolutely. Very somber words yeah, nice, uh, for our viewers. Nice downer for lunch. Um, yes, but you know, also very important words, which is al always why um, I always tell my our clients, come see us if 
only just to have someone hold your hand through all of this because it is hard. Um, and sometimes it has to be done. So, um, so again, thank you so much for being our expert today and you did a wonderful job. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate that. I myself learned a lot since um, I don't do many protective orders here in Maryland. So um, to our viewers uh, next week, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I do apologize. We are going to go on a slight hiatus for a couple of weeks just because the winter months have been very busy here at Maryland Legal Aid. So the next time we will have a legal lunch and learn is going to be on December the 15th. Make sure that you do follow us on Facebook and Instagram and we will definitely be announcing um, the next lunch and learn. So it's going to be on December 15th and the topic is going to be bankruptcy. And for those who have enjoyed uh, listening listening to words of wisdom from William or Bill, as we call him, Steinwindow, he will be back to talk to us about bankruptcy. So if you do have a question about bankruptcy anytime from now until December 15th, you can either leave us a comment or email us. Um, and remember, of course, to share this video if you do find it particularly helpful. Thank you so much and have a good rest of your week.